to Evangel. We're so happy to worship with you today. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, the grass will wither and the flowers will fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Whatever you're fighting through today, whatever you're going through today, it's going to fade away one day. It's going to go, it's going to fade and it's going to wither, but the word of God will stand firm. The word of God will stand strong. It is what we can put our trust in. It is why we praise him. It is why we worship because he is so good. Will you sing this with me? Let the king of my heart. And let the king of my heart be the mountain where I rest, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my soul. And you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. 
just to know the Savior. too short to reach us, even when it doesn't make sense, you're still good, you're so good, alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was 
is redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, and my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, and my life began. Sing, oh, your grace, oh, your grace, so She's over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Josh. If I haven't met you, and Janae and I, uh, my wife Janae, we serve as the lead pastors here at Evangel, and we're in a series right now called Seeds, studying the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to jump right into where we are today in Ephesians 5, verse 21, in a message entitled, Going Underground, Going Underground. Ephesians 5, 21, it says it this way, and further, submit to one another out of reverence 
for Christ. Underline the word submit in your Bible. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. Verse 31, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united in one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I'm a big fan in my home of wrestling with my children. It's a way as a dad that I I bond with them and that I show them who's boss. Uh, But I I, I do love wrestling. It gives Janae a little bit of anxiety, but it's a a, a bonding thing that we do. And, And there's one thing that I'm trying to stop doing, but that's a lot of fun to do, and that's pinning Avery down, my two year old, and and kind of torturing him while I, while I hold his arms down. And it's maybe something as he, as he gets older to maybe teach him is not okay for somebody to hold him down and do that. But uh, for a dad, it's, it's, you know, fun to torture your child in that way. And, uh, and when, when I'm sitting on top of him and holding his arms down, you can look at what I'm doing at that moment and say, that's a submission maneuver. Or maybe you're into wrestling and you know all about the submission maneuvers or UFC. I don't know if they really use submission, more just... TKO, uh, but, but maybe you've seen submission maneuvers, and, and we have this context for what we think submission is, or what submission looks like, and usually it has to do with somebody being in authority over somebody else, but the actual submission move or maneuver that I use with my son every day is not holding his arms down and sitting on top of him and tickling him. That's not the submission maneuver as a father that uh, is the best for me to display. Maybe because I'm stronger than him, I have authority to do that. But the real submission maneuver that I have with my son every day is when we walk into his room at night and he crawls into his crib and we read a book and then we have a a conversation that's pretty well rehearsed but meaningful and I say, Avery, do you want to pray? And he goes, yeah. And he folds his hands and goes... Amen. I'm like, amen. That, that, was, that was a great, powerful, profound prayer. And then I say, Avery, can, can Daddy pray? And he says, yeah. And he folds his hands and he stares at me. And, and I pray a, a similar prayer over him every night. And I'm hoping that he'll learn how to pray as he follows me. And, and then uh, I say, amen. And he says, amen. And I say, Avery, can you, can you tell Daddy your verse? And he says, I am fearfully made. I am and fearfully and wonderfully made. And we go over his verse and then said, that's right, Avery, you are brave and you are smart and you are handsome and you are kind and you are brilliant. You are, you're going to bring hope to other people. And I speak these things into him and then I kiss him on the forehead. We sing a song, which I will spare you from today. And then he goes to bed. And I think about my best submission maneuver as a father is not pinning my son down and tickling him or, or demonstrating my physical power or emotional power or uh, verbal power over him. But my best submission move as a dad every day is to use the power that I have as his father to lift my son up, to, to lift him up as the person that God has called him to be, to lift him up into a young man of God, that he might know Christ from a young age. Why is this important? Because we know that true submission, especially as referred to in Scripture, is not using the power or the authority that you have over another person. That's not truly 
bringing somebody else into submission. True submission and true leadership with submission is using the power that you have to lift another person up. And, and if we use submission in that way, it, may, it means that we may even be in authority or we may even have the most power, but the goal of our power is to be submitted to one another even in our authority, is to be submitted to one another even in our strength, is to be submitted to one another even in our intellect, to use those things as a way to lift up another person. And so Ephesians 5.21 tells us, it says, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What is the Bible saying? It's saying, go underground in other people's lives. Go get underneath somebody else and lift them up. Use any authority and influence and knowledge that you have to live in submission to Christ and in submission to other people by getting under one another and lifting each other up. Why does a seed go underground. A seed goes in the dirt because there's going to come a moment where a sprout comes out of that seed and something is pushed up out of that seed through the dirt, through the earth's surface, and into the sunlight. And this is what it even means for a seed to live in submission, to be buried so that it can lift up and so that it can produce something new. But you and I, by nature, don't want to come under others. We don't want to go low so that we might lift others up. Too often our, our flesh or our culture teaches us that submission is actually about uh, having other people submit to you. It's actually about promoting yourself, making yourself look important, making yourself first and for, foremost, not only in your own mind, but in the mind's of the people around you, but submission is not about using authority to make yourself important. It's about using your authority to build someone up. In this way, submission has absolutely nothing to do with a hierarchy of authority or the order of authority. Submission is what governs the operation of authority. Submission teaches us what the role of authority is. Submission teaches us how authority is given and how authority is received. Think about the life of Jesus. Jesus is traveling around with these, these other men that are his disciples. And they're going across the countryside. They're walking through sheep pasture. They're all over wearing open-toed sandals. And along the way, surely these men are accumulating things on their feet. You know, uh, dirt and grime and whatever else. And one day as Jesus is with his disciples and he's leading them, he does something very profound for a man in authority. And certainly it went against what other religious leaders in his day would have done in expressing their authority. See, while others were standing on street corners and wearing certain outfits to make themselves look like they were people of religious authority, Jesus got into a room with those that he was leading most closely and he got down on his hands and knees with a rag and a bowl of water and he began to wash the 24 feet of his disciples. One by one. I imagine it was an emotional, profound moment for both Jesus and for those that were following him. What's ironic is, you know, not long after, uh, as they step back outside, disciples begin to argue about which one of them is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And they, they still don't quite under understand what authority is really all about and what submission is actually all about. That it is how authority is given and how it is received. And Jesus is teaching them that true authority and true submission is to take somebody else's hairy, uncovered, dusty, stinky feet and to wash them in an act of humility saying what I can do for you and how I can lift you up how I can encourage you how I can serve you is actually better than me just forcing you to be in submission to me he taught that the greatest authority comes with the person who uses their authority to build other people up while the religious leaders use their authority to make themselves important Jesus brought value to the people around him. He brought importance to the people. He brought vision and mission to the people that were around him. And so we find ourselves in a discussion in verse 22 of 
what Paul is writing to us in Ephesians 5, and he says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And you know that verse has been used all sorts of different ways. The way submit has been used in all sorts of different ways, but I would just come to you today and and say that Paul is not saying submit in a way that means you have to listen to everything that I tell you to do, everything that I say. The man is superior to the woman. Rather, he is coming and he is saying, not that you are inferior or in subjection to the men in every situation, but he's saying, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, meaning follow your husband as they follow Jesus. Follow your husband as they follow Jesus. The way that Jesus died and gave his life for a ransom for many, so the husband ought to give for his family. Follow and submit as you submit to Christ. Why? Because true submission is not using power over another person. True submission and leadership and authority is using power to lift another person up. See, the true remedy for our relationships and for our marriages and for the brokenness in, in humanity that you and I have is, is found in being people that are under the lordship of Jesus. People that are truly submitted to Christ. It means that we live submitted to Jesus. We, we have a moment in our life where we stop. We say, God, I'm, I'm giving you control of my life. I'm handing over the reins. I'm getting out of the driver's seat and, and into the passenger seat as you become the commander of this vessel that is my life. And that's a daily decision. We, we know that the remedy is living under the lordship of Jesus by spending time in his word. How do we know his lordship, how do we know what he, he's called us to do and who he's called us to be apart from what his word tells us about him? And we know that living under the lordship of Jesus means seeking to do his will every day, looking at every situation and every moment of our lives and saying, not what do I want, not what, it, what can I do with my authority, what do I have a right to do or to say, but, but rather to say, how do I seek the will of Jesus and follow the will of Jesus in every situation. And then having the obedience to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to be honest in the right moment, to have integrity even when it wants to be compromised. See, while the wife is submitted to the headship, not the dictatorship of the husband, the husband and the wife are both equally submitted to Jesus. So, It's not just be submitted to your husband because he's your husband and he's a man and he has authority over you. It's follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me and submit to me as I submit to Christ Jesus. And also both of us in our individual selves submitting to Christ Jesus in who we are as people. See, there's implications of this lifestyle. There's implications of this decision. One of the implications is that Christians need to marry other Christians. That, that we cannot be unequally yoked with people who don't believe the same thing that you believe. If you enter into a marriage or a relationship like that, where both people are not submitted to Christ Jesus, there won't be godly order in your family. Not only will there not be godly order, but there won't be godly blessing in your family. And there will be, whether it's immediately or over time, a brewing civil war in your family and in your relationship over God's word, over church, over how you're going to live your daily life and spend your money. There will be a civil war about whether or not you will live in submission to Christ Jesus. So we ought to marry people that are equally submitted to Christ Jesus. If you're looking for a spouse, look for somebody who has submitted their life to Christ. And, And focus yourself on submitting your life to Christ Jesus. It's the first step in having a strong relationship in the future. Another implication of allowing Jesus to have lordship of our lives is that couples ought to learn how to be submitted to Christ in their relationship before they get married. Otherwise, we step into the marriage relationship. We've made the commitment. We've already set into some rhythms in the relationship, and we have a weak foundation 
spiritually. Maybe the tension is built up emotionally to be connected or physically to be connected, but the tension to be connected spiritually has been neglected or not built up over time, and we're starting on a weak foundation, and beginning spiritual rhythms in your marriage is going to be difficult. It can happen. You can, you can change that tide, but we should build those the, that foundation even into our relationships as they get more serious and move towards marriage, or even in our friendships and our family relationships as we become more devo- devoted followers of Jesus. Another reason that we should be submitted to Christ before we get married is that if our life is not submitted to Christ in our dating relationship or our engaged relationship or just in, in the relationships that we have in life, then our lives will probably be submitted to sin. And, and the blessing of God on a family over the course of more than just a year, but over the course of a lifetime or over the course of generations comes by being people who are submitted to Christ Jesus. And the Bible gives us instruction. Maybe you're in a marriage today that one of you is submitted and the other isn't. The Bible says you should stand in the gap for the other person. You become one flesh in marriage and you should, you should stand in the gap. You should pray. You should ask God to make a change in your spouse. Not try to twist their arm, not try to change them yourself, but trust God to bring that foundation into your family. Here's the last implication, and it's where I want to park the car here for the next several minutes. It's that husbands, if we are devoted followers of Jesus, living under the lordship of Christ Jesus, then husbands must lead the families that are submitted to them then the husbands in this place, the the boyfriends, the men who are going to lift their family up, who eventually or right now are saying, follow me as I follow Jesus, are going to have to be men that are submitted to Christ Jesus and are submitted to one another, submitted to uh, their marriage, submitted to their children. Why? So they are underground in their marriage, lifting their spouse up. They're underground in their kid's life, lifting their children up. This is what it means to be people who are living in submission. To even be living under the authority of Christ Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says that when we follow him, we ought to lift him up in our lives. And where he's lifted up, he will draw those around us to him. And so we live both as people that are the head of our homes, but also as people who are under submission who are in submission. This is why Paul started by saying, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ Jesus. Let me just give it to you one more time. He says, for a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body. It's worth saying that Paul spends a lot of time instructing men on their responsibility in the marriage, where many people look at these verses and just focus on wives living in submission. It's actually the men that, God, that Paul is giving instruction to by the Spirit of God. He says, Christ is the Savior of his body, the church, as the church submits to Christ. So you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wife, just as Christ loved the church. He gave his life for her. He gave up his life for her to make her holy, and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. The words spot and wrinkle speak to the inside of the person and the wrinkle speaking to the outside of the person. And it means from the inside out, our families, our children are all submitted to Christ and are without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, they will be holy or she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church and we are members of his body. What does it mean for a a man to lead through submission in his family? It means to love sacrificially. Verse 25 tells us over and over again, it says, love your wives, and then it says, give yourself up. And I'll broaden it. It's it's not just loving your wife, it's loving and giving yourself up for your family, loving and giving yourself up for the people around you, being a person who loves 
sacrificially as Christ loved the church. That, that's a high expectation of love that God has for our marriages. That within the marriage context, there would be a love that would be similar to or represented, representation of the love that Christ has for the church. So love sacrificially as Christ loved the church. We know that marriage serves many needs in our society. Uh, and even biblically, it serves an emotional need. The Bible tells us that though some are called to live alone and not be married so that they can fully devote their life uh, to, to God's word and to his mission, that that's a good thing. But, but it's also, it also tells us that it's not good for man to be alone. And so there's a, an emotional need that is met at the, the highest level in Christ and, and then in marriage and then in relationships with other people. There's, there's an emotional purpose to our marriages. There's also a social purpose because having kids continues the race of mankind. There's a physical purpose. The sex. There's a physical purpose to marriage. That God has put desires and needs within the, the heart and the soul of mankind that are able to be fed in a way that give glory to God in the context of marriage. And there's a spiritual purpose to marriage. That the couple experiences between one another, the submission required to follow Jesus and the love received from Jesus. That in the marriage relationship, we gain a greater understanding of the submission required to follow Jesus and the love that we've received from Jesus. So that means that if we're really bad at loving our spouses, we may not have a great understanding of the love of Christ. Or we may not have received the love of Christ. It means that if, if we're fairly terrible at submitting to one another, at lifting one another up, at surrendering our selfishness to one another, that that's a reflection of our willingness to submit to Christ. Or to submit our selfishness to Christ. The intense challenge that you feel to submit to one another in marriage is a reflection of your heart's willingness or unwillingness to submit to Jesus. The Bible tells us that it's a mirror image. We know that Christ gave himself up for the church in a sacrificial way. So we ought to love one another sacrificially. The root of most issues in our, in our marriages today is sin. And the root of most sin, maybe of all sin, is selfishness. And what Christ calls us to do in living sacrificially is the opposite of selfishness. It's the opposite of allowing sin into our hearts and into our marriages. And he tells us that if we will love one another sacrificially, and specifically, if a father and a husband, if the men of the house and the men uh, in our relationships, if we will love sacrificially, it will bring value to our spouses. It will bring value to the women that are around us. It will bring value to the children that we have, it will actually, the Bible says, sanctify them. It will sanctify them in that they will be made clean, made holy, washed by God's Word. I know I'm, I'm talking to the guys in the room today, but I think just the godly order of this message requires it. And so if I, I was to give you an application today about how to love sacrificially, I would say be number one. Every one of us, if we want to lead with sacrifice, is to be the very best that you can be at living in submission to Jesus. Outdo one another in submitting to Christ Jesus and in showing Him honor in our lives and in whatever relationship you're in. Outdo somebody else around you by lifting other people up. And really to live and lead sacrificially means that we must strive to be the very best that we can at submitting to Jesus, at being unselfish. In a real practical sense, in the marriage relationship, husbands, what's a really way that you can live sacrificially? What's a, a, a really practical way that you can demonstrate this in your family? Not only being 
individually submitted to Jesus, but in your marriage being corporately submitted to Jesus. And what that might mean, somebody gave me recent advice, is is to do the one-minute prayer at night. A one-minute prayer. And here's the rules of the one-minute prayer. The husband initiates the one-minute prayer, and the wife isn't allowed to criticize the one-minute prayer. That's the success of the one-minute prayer. And maybe it just means leading sacrificially means taking, sometimes sacrifice is initiative, taking the initiative to grab your spouse's hand, to pray blessings into their life, protection over your family for 60 seconds, and to begin to include the spiritual in your relationship. Maybe that's one way that you can love sacrificially. But overall, all of us are called to follow the example of Jesus. And that means to a world around us that is hurting and and that is in pain, to a world around us that needs encouraged and lifted up, we ought to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ Jesus. Let me give you you one more thought about the implications of of husbands needing to lead their families that that are submitted to them. And it means this, to love satisfyingly. Love sacrificially. And verse 28 tells us what it is to love satisfyingly. And love satisfyingly means that you and I ought to love our wives in the way that we love ourselves. Now let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean uh, the way you love yourself, love your spouse that way. But it does mean as you love your spouse, your love for yourself will grow. That as you love the people around you, your love for yourself will grow. And I know I'm primarily talking to men, but this this principle works across many other spectrums, that as we love people and as we love God, as we respect people and as we respect God, our love for ourself will grow, our respect for ourself will grow. We feel unloved and disrespected many times because we don't give love and we don't give respect and we are reaping what we're sowing. But if we will love in a way that is satisfying, it means that we will love people and we will respect people and specifically husbands will love our wives and that will cause us to feel a greater sense of trust and love and respect for ourselves. Why? Because the Bible tells us that in marriage the two become one. And that means whatever you are sowing into the other person, you're sowing into yourself. That whatever you're sowing into the other person in your marriage relationship, or you're actually sowing into your own life. And what you sow, you will eventually reap. If you disrespect your spouse, you will eventually lose respect for yourself. If you don't love your spouse, you will lose love for yourself. This works in many other levels of authority. If the disciples had stopped loving Jesus, they would have lost sight of what it meant to love themselves. If they had stopped respecting Jesus, they would have lost sight of what it meant to respect themselves. And this is what, why God places authority in our lives so we can learn how to love and respect even when we don't want to respect. This is why the Bible says even when you don't pray or when you don't agree with government authorities, pray for them. Lift them up. Be people that, that don't chatter above ground, but be people that go underground on behalf of even your enemies, even the people that you don't agree with, even the people that you don't think you're ever going to see eye to eye again. Don't fight on, on, on the exterior. Don't get on top of the soil and have a royal rumble. Get underneath and begin to lift other people up through encouragement, through prayer, being a person like Jesus that didn't Look at anybody else like he was better than them. But every person that he encountered, he got low. He got underneath them and he began to lift them up. So much so that he would give his own life for them eventually. This is the example that Christ has given us that ought to encourage us and spur us on. But even more than that, he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to do it. One commentary says it this way. It says, Paul referred to the creation of Eve in the Garden of Eden and the forming of the first home. Adam had to give a part of himself in order to get a bride. We know that God took from the man to create the woman. But Christ gave all of himself to purchase his bride at the cross. 
If you don't know, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. He's the bridegroom who will return for his bride. God opened Adam's side, but sinful men pierced Christ's side. So united are husband and wife that they are one flesh. Their union is even closer than that of parents and their children. What a great reminder for those of us that have children. That that we ought to love our spouse with first priority because we are one flesh. Our children will abandon us. The believer's union with Christ is, is even closer. And unlike human marriage will last through all eternity. Paul closed with a final admonition that the husband love his wife and that the wife reverence or respect her husband, both of which require the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is not a a message to point at your spouse or to point at somebody around you and expect them to be more submitted or expect them to be together, but this is a, a moment to look at your own spirit. And to say, my spirit is my responsibility. And the way I respond to my partner in marriage, the way that I respond to those in authority over me, the way that I respond to those that I'm leading is a matter of my heart and my spirit. And even if I can't control what the other person does, even if I can't control what everything looks like, I can live as a person who is submitted to Christ Jesus. And in everything I do, lifting other people up the way that Christ lifted other people up. Paul speaks about the same topic in Colossians and he gives us this final command or encouragement speaking about the same topic in Colossians 3. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Do it and do it to the best of your ability out of reverence for Christ Jesus. Lift other people up out of reverence for Christ Jesus since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. You are not fighting your spouse. You're fighting the spirit in you that doesn't want to submit to Christ Jesus, that doesn't want to submit and lift one another up. And it might take some tangles to make it happen. But the number one seed that you and I can plant today is to choose to plant a seed that says, I will live in submission to the people around me by going underground and lifting one another up through encouragement. I will lift one another up by having a right attitude. I will lift one another up by working with all my strength. I will lift up the people that are around me. Amen. Would you stand with me? Maybe you're here today and I think about that word submission. You know, sub meaning meaning under. And mission meaning mission. And really putting it together and being somebody that is is under a mission. That is that is under the mission of what Christ has called you to do, getting your life under Jesus and lifting him up in everything that you do. And maybe you look at areas of your life where where you've not been in submission to Christ. You've not been under his mission. You've been under your own mission. And today you know that you need to make a decision to begin to lift Jesus up in your decisions, to begin to lift Jesus up in your everyday life, to begin to lift Jesus up in your marriage where you haven't included him maybe. And if that's you today, would you just lift a hand and respond with me? Or maybe you're here today and you're in a marriage right now and and, and there's difficulty. Maybe you need to grab the hand of your spouse and you need to lift your hands together and say, Jesus, we're going to live in submission to one another and ultimately living in submission to you. We're going um, to we're gonna follow as we follow Christ. And today, would you help us to be people that don't live with anger or frustration or selfish ambition or our own wants or our own needs, but help us to be people that live in submission to you and to one another. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. We're so glad you joined us today. Our hope is that you're challenged and encouraged by these teachings every week. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry to change lives. Send us an email at mystory@goevangel.org. For more information about our church, check us out online at goevangel.org.